Hello. Good afternoon, and welcome to the John Carter Brown Library. I'm Karen Wolf. I'm the director of the library, and it's such a pleasure to have you all here. We're really especially delighted to welcome you for this exciting program. Thinking about the ethics of special collections, archives, and libraries is a core commitment for the JCB. As a library of colonialism focused on the early Americas, we think every day about the materials that we hold and the implications of our work with them, what's highlighted in these materials and what is marginalized. So it's a special privilege to be thinking today about the presence and importance of disability in the archives. Thanks so much to the Kogut Institute for partnering with us and for frankly shouldering the lion's share of organizing and to the Hay Library for co-sponsoring. So I'm gonna quickly turn this over to Leon Hilton who's convener of the Disability Studies Working Group sponsored by Kogut and he will introduce our very wonderful special speaker. Hi, good afternoon everyone. It's great to see, see you all. And um, Yes, thank you, Karen. Um, my name is Leon Hilton. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Theater, Arts, and Performance Studies here at Brown. Um, and I'm also the co-convener of the Disability Studies Working Group, which is a, a program sponsored by the Kogut Institute. Um, so I really just want to thank everyone involved in making this event happen, particularly our friends at Kogut, without whom this would, none of this would have been possible. So it's really a pleasure to, to collaborate in this way. So I have the honor of introducing our speaker today. Um, Jennifer Barclay is Associate Professor of History and the Associate Director of the Center for Disability Studies at the University at Buffalo. Her research places African-American history into conversation with the new disability history, a field that emphasizes disability as a lived human experience embedded in a set of socially constructed ideas that change over time across cultures and re in relation to other categories of identity such as race, gender, class, and sexuality. This approach is at the heart of her first book, The Mark of Slavery, Disability, Race, and Gender in Antebellum America from the University of Illinois Press in 2021. This work centers on the lives of disabled enslaved people and the larger metaphorical ontological links that antebellum Americans forged between disability, race, and gender. She reads traditional sources against the grain to consider the experiences of enslaved people with physical, sensory, and psychological disabilities. She also uses disability as a category of historical analysis to shed light on 19th century racial projects, specifically the ways that anxious whites linked blackness to the resounding stigma of disability to shore up their own racial identity as the prospect of black freedom and citizenship loomed nearer. The research she undertook for her first book led, to, uh, led her to question the influence of ableism on the preservation and interpretation of the historical record. How is it that, in the words of historian Douglas Bainton, disability is everywhere in history once you begin to look for it, but conspicuously absent in the histories we write? Why is disability enveloped in this paradox? What forces and factors create this dynamic? Working with Stephanie Hunt Kennedy, um, at the University of New Brunswick. She is currently co-editing um, Cripping the Archive, Disability, History, and Power, which I think is the project she's gonna share with us today um, and expected to appear in 2024. This collection of interdisciplinary scholarship examines archival power by uncovering disability in contested archives, challenging how we define the archive, and exploring the creation of inclusive archives accountable to and centered on people with disabilities and disability justice. She's also working on another monograph uh, titled Between Two Worlds, Disability and Segregation in Southern Education from Emancipation to Integration, which will explore how, in the wake of the Civil War, the forces of intersectional erasure complicated the lives and educational opportunities of free people with disabilities. And we're just really happy to have her uh, this afternoon. So please join me in welcoming Jennifer. <laughs> Thank you so much for that uh, warm introduction. Um, before I begin, I would like to sort of thank the co-sponsors of this event, the Kogut Institute for the Humanities, the John Carter Brown Library, uh, the Hayes Library, and specifically I'd like to thank Leon, Alani, and Karen 
um, as well as Ben for inviting me uh, and being just generous hosts, uh, but also for creating this really wonderful space to talk about disability studies. Um, it's, it's a really important um, topic. It's one, obviously, that's near and dear to my heart, so I'm really happy to be here uh, having this conversation with you all. Um, and thanks to everyone, too, uh, for being here, for being in the room, uh, and for being out there in Zoom land, uh, taking the time out of your day to come. I really appreciate it. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so in 2017, uh, Oxford Essential Quotations in included disability historian Douglas Bainton's well-known refrain, disability is everywhere in history once you begin looking for it, but conspicuously absent in the histories we write. The quote's inclusion in this volume um, demonstrates you know, how significant uh, disability history was becoming at this time and how folks were becoming more aware of disability history, yet many questions related to it remain unanswered. Why is disability enveloped in this paradox? What forces and factors create this dynamic? How is disability everywhere and nowhere, present and absent, obvious and overlooked in both the historical record and historians' interpretations of the past? So disability studies scholars have made many arguments about why disability is so often overlooked in the scholarship of various disciplines. Some claim that it triggers epistemological anxieties. Others speak more broadly of scholars' fear, discomfort, and avoidance of disability because of the way it forces us to confront the instability of our own corporeality. Others yet highlight ableist assumptions, such as the belief that disability is a narrow medicalized topic relevant only to disabled people and their caregivers, or that disability teaches us little about power and broader social, political, economic, and cultural concerns. As historian Kathy Kudlick once explained it, disability and disabled people can easily be written off as just another other. In relation to history specifically, the erasure and elision of disability sometimes happens at a much deeper level within the archives themselves. This occurs in a multitude of ways, and acknowledging this reality opens up many interrelated issues about methodological approaches, interpretation, access, and disability justice. These are precisely the kinds of issues that I'm interested in addressing, along with my co-editor, Stephanie Hunt Kennedy, and the many contributors to our forthcoming collection, Cripping the Archive, Disability History and Power. This volume includes incredible scholarship by folks working in history, English, deaf studies, architecture, gerontology, so many different fields, uh, as well as archivists and museum professionals. Collectively, we're interested in considering not only how, but why physical, sensory, and psychological disabilities are underrepresented, erased, or distorted in the written and material historical record. Building on the recent work of scholars who put the issue of disability on the map in the field of critical archival studies, contributors explore archival power by uncovering disability in, our, in contested archives, challenging how we define the archive, demonstrating the significance of creating inclusive archives accountable to and centered on disabled people, and disrupting ableist power structures and dynamics. By exploring the ways that ableness informs the politics of the archive as a physical space, a discriminatory record, and a collection of silences, Cripping the Archive models an, inter an intersectional and interdisciplinary approach that bridges disability studies, history, and archival studies. <clears throat> Today, I'll discuss the genesis of the collection and spotlight several chapters to give you a sense of the breadth and the depth of scholarly interventions the contributors are making. So the idea for this collection grew out of a conversation that I had one summer uh, with Stephanie about our own experiences of finding disability in the archives of slavery. We had both recently finished our first books on slavery, disability, and race. Stephanie's deals with the British Caribbean uh, and mine with Antebellum America. As slavery scholars have noted, archives reflect the power, inequality, and racism that undergirded Atlantic slavery. Archives, then, are not only sites of knowledge, but sites of injustice. In our books, we attempted to, in the words of scholar Marissa Fuentes, quote, narrate the fleeting glimpses of enslaved subjects in the archive. And yet, we quickly discovered that centering disability in histories of slavery generates even more challenges in archival excavation and takes the question of the archive in new directions. Disability added another layer of complexity, erasure, and discrimination to the archival experience. Both US and Caribbean archives reflected the pervasiveness of able ableism and its influence on the archive as a place that protects, 
preserves, legitimizes, and sanctifies certain documents while it negates and destroys others. <clears throat> The archives we visited, for instance, offered no finding aids for locating disability. Most archivists were not versed in disability history and therefore were unprepared to give us direction. Our search words were things like lame, crippled, mad, insane, and invalid, a lexicon shaped by a long history of pathologization and biomedical and cultural oppression. Through trial and error, we both discovered that to find disability in slavery's archive meant to look for sources steeped in colonial violence that told many different and sometimes competing stories of disability. At the same time, we each discovered disability hidden in plain sight in primary sources like the well-known autobiographies of Frederick Douglass and Mary Prince. As our excitement grew over our shared experiences with researching disability, we knew that there was something to be said about the power of ableism in the historical record. We connected these ideas to theories that shaped our own intellectual trajectories over the years, from the significance of unmarked markers, uh, the influence and ubiquity of Rosemary Garland Thompson's figure of the normate, um, and the obliviousness of privilege, to the profound but often overlooked role that disability plays in intersectionality, and how ableism shapes the content and form of the historical knowledge and narratives we construct. We knew by the end of that conversation that we wanted to crypt the archive by demonstrating what a critical disability approach teaches us about history and power. Crip signifies a process of reclamation and pride, resting an ableist term away from those who champion a fantasy of being normal and investing it with a more nuanced, accurate set of meanings based on the complexities of disabled people's lives. Crip also encompasses an identity and sense of community based on shared experiences of disability and ableism. To crypt the archive in this sense means to center disabled people, find creative methodologies to reclaim their histories, and confront the limiting nature of how their experiences appear in primary sources, if they appear at all. But as disability studies, and specifically CRIP theory, teaches us, CRIP is also a verb, an analytic, a framework that moves beyond identity-based approaches to disability, and instead challenges us to reckon with disability as a set of ideas that change over time and structure larger systems of privilege and, and oppression. Cripping, then, is, in the words of Robert McRuer, the process of critically interrogating, quote, how private or privatized versus public cultures of, of ability or disability are conceived, materialized, spatialized, and populated. This happens in repetitive ways that maintain the hegemony of what he calls compulsory able-bodiedness. Archives play a pivotal but often unacknowledged role in producing and sustaining social and cultural norms about the body, from the kinds of sources that they house and their content to how these materials are made available and to whom. The archive is most often thought of as a brick and mortar building, usually with a governmental association or institutional affiliation. That, sh that, st that stores documents from the past. In the past decade, many archives have moved to digitized documents, making historians less dependent on the physical archival building. The digital uptake has also seen the creation of digital archives that are unassociated with a governing body. Historians themselves have created online archives, many of which are open access. Even still, the archival process, the act of deciding what gets archived and what does not, is not a value neutral process. At the basis of every historical narrative is a question about positioning, and this is also an ethical question. Whose history are you telling, and from whose perspective? The representation of disabled people in the historical record often reflects the medical, social, colonial, and legal systems that created the record, resulting in evidence of fragmented personhoods, stories of overcoming or pity, sensationalized and exploitative representations, and complete erasures and silences. Cripping the archive questions these framings of disability across time and space, reflects on the disabled scholar's experience in the archive, and creates counter archives by expanding our definition of an archive. The collection consists of 21 chapters, shorter chapters, but 21 nonetheless, 21 chapters, which shows you, right, like just how much excitement I think that this generated among people. So 21 chapters that are divided into five sections, uncovering, obscuring, decolonizing, decentering, and accessing. 
Part one, Uncovering, includes chapters that examine the ways that disability has been hidden and erased in the historical record and how scholars can challenge these silences to uncover disability. The chapter, these chapters deal with subjects as varied as the absence of disability in Romanian history, the politics of revealing hidden histories through ableist objects in the British Museum, and the potential and pitfalls of digital archives like the open access trove platform of the National Library of Australia that uncover previously obscured records of disability. We chose to open the book with this section because we wanted readers to understand what we mean when we say that disability is silenced in the archives and in historical scholarship. What does that look like? And just as importantly, how do scholars confront these silences? Since I can't speak comprehensively about all of the chapters in this section, I wish I could about every single one of the chapters because they're all amazing, um, but I'm gonna focus on just one from this section. So Nina Vollenbroker's chapter, Deafening Architectural Modernism, Reconsidering the Archive of Adolf Loos, argues that key elements of Loos's visionary modernist architecture of the late 19th and early 20th centuries were rooted in his deaf sensory experiences and abilities. Critically foregrounding Loos's deafness, Vollenbroker reconsiders moments in the, in the architect's written and built projects, calling attention to alternative ways of thinking about space. She first considers the architect's life and early work from a sensory science perspective. Drawing on key theories in deaf and disability studies, Vollenbroker unearths disability in a range of archival materials. Concepts such as deaf gain and deaf critical insight, for instance, demonstrate that deaf knowledge is a distinct form of situated awareness rooted in deaf individuals' social, body, bodily, and spatial experiences. As architect Hansel ba Bauman explains, quote, deaf people inhabit a rich sensory world in which lies the seed of a profound approach to experiencing our built environment. He asserts that deafness does not merely adjust the way a person understands space, but also influences the way they create space. So you can see where Vollenbroker is going with this. Uh, vision and touch, he emphasizes, are at the heart of deaf relationships with the built environment. Layering these insights onto archival materials that include floor plans and images of spaces that Loos designed, Vollenbroker highlights how his deafness afforded him a particular vantage point and creative approach to space. Focusing on walls, she investigates the perimeters of the spaces Loos created through notions of vision and touch. Unlike hearing folks who use vision and hearing to monitor their peripheral vision field, deaf people rely on vision and touch and have less tolerance for visual clutter in the periphery. Vollenbroker uses this insight to interpret the clean, uninterrupted lines of internal and external walls of houses that Loos designed. She also calls attention to how Loos used rich materials and finishes on walls to activate both visual and tactile senses, or haptic vision. She corroborates this by citing Loos's written work. Quote, what I want is for people to feel the material in my rooms, he noted in an essay. I want them to know about the closed space, to feel the material, the wood, to perceive with their sense of vision and their sense of touch. Vollenbroker then turns her attention to the architect's later life and approaches it from a sociocultural angle. Focusing on interior space, she investigates how Loos's interconnected rooms and distinct circulation routes frame communication and experiences. She examines Loos's design of Villa Mueller in Prague that showcases his revolutionary notion of Romplin, a complex arrangement that does away with segregated rooms, instead allowing for interior space to, to flow between all areas and across varying levels of, of a building. Vollenbroker compellingly argues that Raumplin was a design influenced by Loos's deafness and deaf modes of spatial communication. Language located in the body demands and creates a different kind of architecture. Again, drawing on architect Hansel Bauman, Vollman, Vollenbroker no notes how the homes of deaf people share attributes like the absence of secluded rooms, openings between spaces, and vistas between different points in the house to allow for communication. In much the same way, Loos's Raumplin provides space that dismantles traditional frameworks, fractures enclosures, and creates visual connection. The next section of Cripping the Archive, Obscuring, delves more deeply into the many ways that formal archives intentionally and unintentionally obscure the everyday histories of disabled people 
and the role of the state in this process, as well as the significance of context for understanding how and why this happens. One contributor, Maria Gallerini, explores how Cold War politics veiled and even destroyed records of the international blind movement in Eastern and Western archives. Francine Almash and Jane Vale map the architectural erasures of New York City's so-called 600 schools that were sites of removal and segregation for black and Puerto Rican students labeled socially maladjusted in the 1960s. Additional chapters written by Audra Jennings and Sarah Hanley Cousins highlight how even the most well-intentioned state actions work against scholars' ability to access disabled people's personal histories in the archive. A civil war and disability historian, Sarah Hanley Cousins explores the role of the state in obscuring historical records by looking at laws that restrict access to archival materials dealing with sensitive patient files. She focuses in particular on those related to mental health, such as New York's mental hygiene law. In mapping the tangle of state laws in often contradictory ways they are operationalized, Hanley Cousins illuminates the tension between patient confidentiality and disability scholars' use of medical records, which are sometimes the only available sources to access their inner worlds. While intended to protect the privacy and dignity of patients, these laws also obscure their lived experiences and target those with psychological as opposed to physical or sensory disabilities. Describing her experience conducting research in the patient case files of the New York State Lunatic Asylum, Hanley Cousins explains the process of applying for qualified researcher status from the state archives and the Office of Mental Health, then going through an institutional review board. Once she cleared these hurdles, she could access institutional records that document the treatment of Civil War veterans who experienced war trauma. In order to use these materials, however, she had to assign a pseudonym to each person to maintain confidentiality. This created several interrelated problems. Disability historians routinely read medical sources against the grain to counteract their pathologizing power. This involves understanding the wider context of the individual's life as much as possible. When Hanley Cousins gathered these outside details about patients, she found herself in what she calls a confidentiality trap. Even without names included, these details could identify patients. Plus, to include the details required a citation. To do so meant that she had to either alter the citation with the pseudonym or risk exposing the person's identity. As Hanley Cousins' chapter teaches us, New York is not the only state that restricts archival material related to mental health and institutions. She notes, though, that while New York's law makes it onerous to access records, at least there's a process in place to do so. Massachusetts records are completely sealed without any avenue to access, even for researchers. Other states are more ambiguous. In Pennsylvania, access to restricted records depends entirely on the archive, the archivist, and the researcher. Hanley Cousins recounts how she was given access to state hospital records of patients who had been deceased for over 50 years. Yet a colleague was told that a similar collection in a different institution in the state was restricted under federal HIPAA law. Some states have no laws that specifically restrict access, but fear that providing access will be a privacy violation anyways. One researcher, for instance, was granted access to the 19th century patient case files of a mental institution in Virginia one day. The next, they were literally yanked from her hands. As Hanley Cousins explains, on the surface, these restrictions have the appearance of adopting a patient-centered approach to mental health records. After all, our own, mental re our own medical records contain most of the um, most intimate details of our lives, descriptions of our bodies, and details of private, vulnerable moments. Yet most disabled people <clears throat> did not leave behind rich archival collections. Medical records, then, are vital to historians who attempt to reconstruct disabled people's lives from these details. Between annotations of body temperature and medications administered, these kinds of records can be imaginatively read and interpreted to offer up glimpses into disabled people's lives. Audra Jennings' chapter also teaches us about the role of the state and significance of context in uncovering disability in the archive. She draws on her experience of conducting archival research as a historian of disability in the United States during the Great Depression and World War II. As she makes clear, the state's fragmented, shifting understandings and policy approaches to disability in this time 
created rich records of the lived experience of disability, as well as considerable challenges in finding and accessing them. The tumultuous decades of the early 20th century encompassed profound social and economic change, war, and waves of reform that led to significant state growth. In the midst of that state expansion, disability and ability, alongside race and gender, continued to shape what historian and legal scholar Barbara Young, Young Welke calls the borders of belongings, or categories of privilege and exclusion embedded in American law. This particular moment of significant state growth, increasing concerns about disability, and growing numbers of disabled people shape the types of record, um, documents in the archive and how and where they appear. Myriad programs and services were administered by different federal agencies and caused confusion that led to citizens writing to their state representatives, senators, and even the president. Today, these records are housed across numerous archives. For example, Jennings explains how Congress tasked the Children's Bureau with managing programs that address childhood disability. Yet the Children's Bureau shared responsibility for disability prevention with the U.S. Public Health Service, and they also worked with the Office of Education when it came to training disabled youth for work. Complicating that even further, during the New Deal, the, the Works Project Progress Administration assisted with and absorbed many aspects of the Bureau's work related to childhood disability. So today, those records are spread across all of these different archives, even though they're all interrelated. There's no way to sort of connect them to one another. Um, and it shows us, right, the, the, the significance, the importance of thinking about context um, for the way these, these materials were produced, where they're housed, and how they create these sort of diffuse and very far-flung archives. Additional barriers to accessing this information stem from context-specific language and the state's varying perceptions of disability. Locating disability in any archive requires an understanding of the particular context. What constituted disability at that moment who defined disability, what words described it. As an example, Jennings notes that within the records of the Works Progress Administration, some records about disabled people's experiences appear in a file labeled unemployables. This term was, was you know, shaped by changing ideas about work and bodies, as well as the economic circumstances of the Great Depression. The label calls attention to the need to understand what shaped disability, who defined it, how people talked about it, when and in what circumstances it was considered a problem, and who responded to this problem. This particular case demonstrates how disability can be ubiquitous within a certain archive, yet entirely absent from finding aids. <clears throat> the chapters that comprise part three of the collection, Decolonizing, challenge readers to recognize and counter Western biomedical framings of disability that shape the content of most formal archives in the global north, and erase or pathologize disability experiences and situated knowledge of indigenous people in the global south. Stephanie and I contribute an initial chapter to this section, The Global Politics of the Unarchivable, that maps out some of the key concerns that animate critical global disability studies, a subfield reflected in the work of scholars like Sean Gretsch and Helen Mikosha, uh, Nirmala Aravelis, Esme Cleo, and many others. Uh, critical global disability studies, according to Gretsch, deals with, quote, learning the context, cultures, ideologies, knowledge, experiences, and lives of those we talk about the way they interpret and know their own world. It is open to alternative epistemologies, realities, and ways of knowing, learning, and talking about worlds already out there. Applying some of these insights to the archival context highlights the need to decolonize archives by centering non-Western understandings of disability and accounting for their misrepresentation in and erasure from conventional archives. Another critical concern involves accessibility in Global South archives writ large. This includes obvious ways that archives are often physically inaccessible spaces for disabled researchers, but also how social, political, and material conditions exacerbate this inaccessibility. For instance, the intentional and unintentional closure and destruction of archives during times of war or unrest, inadequate resources to maintain archives, and displaced or hidden archives that remain under the control of former colonial powers. Historian Heather Vrana also contributes to this section by considering the limitations of Guatemalan and more broadly Central American archives of disability. 
As they make clear, these shortcomings are often related to historical logics of the state, the church, and biomedicine that erases disability outright or frames it as relevant only to health or charity. Working around these limitations, Vrana turns to the so-called Hall of Miracles in the tourist town of Antigua. Here, disabled people from Guatemala, El Salvador, Mexico, Nicaragua, the United States, and elsewhere leave offerings like prosthetics and orthotics to St. Armano Pedro in gratitude for answering their prayers. This space, Vrana explains, bears witness to Latin American crip world making and exemplifies a community-based archive of disability. They argue that by centering on the perspectives and lived realities of Latin Americans captured in such spaces, disability historians can develop more nuanced understandings of care, cure, and faith. Vrana's work demonstrates how Global South perspectives on disability complicate some of the prevailing, prevailing tenets of disability studies, since disability studies sort of emanates from the global north, like there's a sense that the religious model of, of disability sort of existed prior to the Industrial Revolution, and then that was sort of displaced by scientific understandings of disability, and religion sort of, you know, leaves the equation. <laughs> and her work is really important for kind of challenging us to rethink that, right, to think about how religion actually factors very much into these community-based archives. Um, so two additional chapters round out this section, and again, I wish I could talk about uh, both of them at depth because I think this is really fascinating. Um, but the two chapters are written by Sarah Witt, Tracy Voyles, Susan Birch, and Jessica Cowing, um, all of whom are scholars grappling with disability, indigeneity, and Native American history. Together, their contributions model alternative methods of navigating biased and fractured settler colonial archives. These include working from a different indigenous-focused archival center and restoring narratives of archival silences. As Sarah Witt poignantly remarks, quote, the archive, as it proves time and time again, is inadequate to the task of remembering, but has never stopped us from trying to resist its investment in forgetting. The chapters of uh, Cripping the Archives Fourth Section, Decentering, displace the pervasive hegemony of ableism in the archive. They challenge readers to reckon with archives and archival practices that, despite their flaws, center on disabled people. A group of scholars from Gallaudet University, professors of history and deaf studies, as well as archivists and museum professionals, draw on their personal and professional experiences to expose autism and ableism in conventional archival holdings and practices. Lead author Octavian Robinson, along with colleagues Meredith Peruzzi, James McCarthy, William Ennis, Brian Greenwald, and Joseph Murray, reflect on the history of deaf representation in archives curated by hearing scholars, or what they call non-deaf archives, just for sort of shorthand. As they explain, quote, in non-deaf archives, we struggle to find ourselves. Hearing archivists commonly overlook the lives and works of deaf people as a subject of collection. Being largely unaware of the cultural background and significance of materials produced by deaf people, hearing archivists often misidentify or mislabel them. This obscures deafness, signed languages, and deaf histories from researchers. When deaf people are included in non-deaf archives, the authors point out, their presence is often mediated by a clinical gaze that pathologizes them. Plus, because of the archive's preference for the written word, they favor print English, regardless of whether the archive is deaf-led and managed or not. This privileges the perspectives of print literate deaf people, who historically were often white and more elite, with greater access to education. Prioritizing written sources produced by print literate deaf people also upholds damaging assumptions. This includes the misguided belief that signed languages are less complex than spoken and written forms of communication, or the idea that signed languages simply replicate spoken and written languages. So in other words, like conflating American Sign Language with English and assuming they're the same thing when they're not. So ultimately, the authors explain, quote, without direct capture of deaf people's experiences through their most natural languaging modality, signed language, any pre-cinematic accounting of deaf people in the archive is inherently incomplete. The chapter continues with a discussion of deaf archives, um, deaf-focused archives at Gallaudet, the Rochester Institute of Technology, and other institutions in Denmark and Flanders. 
The authors recount stories shared with them by deaf archivists that speak to the lack of care accorded to deaf materials. Um, so in one instance, a former Gallaudet University archivist visited a deaf school that left two centuries of paper records in a damp, hot space. Um, documents that likely included the writing of major figures in deaf history, so they just weren't sort of cared for at all. Um, in another instance, when the Pennsylvania School for the Deaf was being retrofitted in the 1980s, its historical records were, quote, dumped in the middle of the gymnasium. Gallaudet archivist rented a truck and drove from Washington, D.C. to Philadelphia to rescue the papers before they were discarded. While the authors convey the power and importance of the work of deaf archivists and these spaces of deaf archives, they also acknowledge their tendency to, quote, replicate the power relations and silences found in archives more generally by preserving and recording some deaf experiences while ignoring others. This is particularly true for black deaf people who were historically excluded from deaf schools and organizations. Similar to the ways that deaf scholars call attention to forms of linguistic chauvinism that value the spoken and written word over signed languages, another chapter in this collection connects to language and the ways that scholars produce and interpret archival material. Osnat Katz and Sam Samuel Brady argue that while oral histories have been a powerful tool for reclaiming and recording previously hidden histories of disabled people, this methodology inherently privileges those who can communicate verbally. With its focus on orality and a particular kind of linear narration, oral history excludes and constrains some groups of disabled and neurodivergent people, both as participants and as researchers. In another parallel, Liana Glue calls on readers to reckon with the ableism that shapes how we value and interpret archival material. Glue examines Vanda Vieria Schmidt, an artist in, German, in a German inpatient psychiatric facility whose creative expressions are not considered art, but rather evidence of her insanity. Glue argues that Vieria Schmidt and other mad artists are worthy of being archived in a manner that documents their creative output as evidence of their artistry and politically active pursuits, not of pathology. In the final section of the collection, Accessing, scholar, authors explore the experience of accessing, and create, of accessing and creating archives of disability, drawing on their own experiential knowledge to inform their work and prioritizing accountability to disability communities, especially those that are multiply marginalized. In the opening chapter of this section, Grayson Brillmeyer discusses the affective experience of disabled researchers when confronted with primary sources about disabled people from the past. Through interviews with disabled scholars, artists, activists, and community members in the United States and Canada, Brillmeyer explores the impact of archival research on disabled individuals and how they imagine themselves in history. Others in this section discuss the experience of creating archives Nikki Pombier, for instance, discusses the experience of creating an archive from the, ne from the neglected documents of the Pennhurst State School and Hospital in Pennsylvania. To do this, she works with a team of community members, community archivists, former Pennhurst residents, self-advocates with intellectual and developmental disabilities, support staff, family members, and multidisciplinary artists. Pombier is joined by other scholars in this section who show what it looks like to not retrieve from the archive, but create an archive. Uh, several scholars, headed by Mary G. and Hand, uh, discuss the creation of a digital living archive designed to maximize accessibility across ages and body minds. An extension of one of the author's um, Instagram account and informed by the principles of disability justice, the chapter discusses the process of creating an interactive digital archive and multilingual dictionary of disability and care. Significantly, this project um, it also aims to sort of connect diverse groups of, of disabled and mad people in the global south and other places in the world that have been largely ignored by disability scholars in the global north. These scholars illustrate what happens when we center disabled people in the creation of archives where, as my colleague Stephanie Hunt Kennedy describes it, they, quote, are not simply invited to sit at the table, but rather are active participants in setting the table.
As a whole, Cripping the Archive calls on scholars across disciplines to reject ableism in their encounters with the archive and acknowledge how it often operates in conjunction with other forms of oppression. Scholars have embraced the familiar triad of race, gender, and class, but continue to view disability as abnormal, exceptional, and beyond the scope of analysis. According to this logic, disabled people are unexplainable, so attempts to, dis to study disabled people and use disability as, a ca as an analytic are futile. The irony is, of course, the universality of disability to the human condition. Disability does not discriminate. All of us, regardless of age, sex, gender, class, nationality, race, or economic status, will likely become disabled in our lifetime through accident, disease, or natural processes such as aging. At one time, disability activists called attention to this reality by using the term TABS for temporarily able-bodied. So confronting the ableism inherent in the archive and centering the lives of disabled people offers alternative ways of understanding the past that challenge and displace these dominant narratives. This has implications for contemporary times too, considering that ableism in the present requires ableism of the past. To paraphrase historian William Lauren Katz, if you believe people have no history worth mentioning, it's easy to believe they have no humanity worth defending. By showcasing a variety of interdisciplinary and theoretical approaches, this collection of truly phenomenal scholarship, I mean, really, it's phenomenal. I'm sure I did not do justice to these amazing uh, chapters in this. I'm, I'm really privileged to be in the position of having read them. Um, you know, it, it's such a truly phenomenal um, work of scholarship, and they offer these so many just new methodologies to explore archival imbalances, uncover systems of power, and deconstruct their influences on historical records. Uh, that inform our work, like the work that they're doing is just so important. So Haitian scholar Michel Rolf Trio wrote that history is the fruit of power, and while, the, and while the ultimate mark of power may be its invisibility, the ultimate challenge is the exposition of its roots. Cripping the archive sees, seeks to reveal how power produces an abyss of silence and absence about disability so that we can begin to do the hard work of confronting ableism in all of its many manifestations at the source. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I think sure. we have time for questions. Uh, first off, thank you so much uh, for this talk. It was really, really interesting. Um, I work with um, indigenous languages and uh, documenting those languages. And a big question for us is a lot of what came up um, and I believe one of the first sections where how do you balance um, privacy and in the case of like tribal information, um, sovereignty mm -hmm. uh, with um, making sure you have this variety of um, perspectives and with uh, making sure that people can access information about themselves. I was wondering if there's anything uh, in this particular volume about the, that intersection in the U.S. or or in North America or in um, Australia? Because I know those two, that's a big, the sovereignty part is a big question there. Yeah, there are no contributors who are sort of working on some of these issues in within Australia. Um, but, you know, I mentioned Susan Birch and Tracy Witt and uh, several other folks, um, you know, who are looking at things, you know, uh, <laughs> that are interrelated, that are sort of connected to this, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to think, um, reflect on those two chapters um, about Indigenous people's experiences, because I think both of the, one in particular, um, the chapter, it's sort of collectively written by uh, Sarah Witt, Tracy Voiles, and Susan Birch, and I love this chapter because it's framed as a discussion between the three of them, right? It like really sort of practices <laughs> like what it preaches, right, about sort of this engaged um, scholarship where, where folks are kind of contributing, like, contributing in an equal way. Um, and, you know, they're really interested in sort of thinking about settler ableism and how that sort of impacts um, archives, but also, you know, all of them, I think, throughout the piece sort of talk about, like, the issue of accountability and being accountable to people, but also, um, you know, how indigenous people themselves need to have access, right, to, like, they're looking at, in, I think, in many cases, federal archives, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but they talk about how these spaces are so closed, right, like, without having the credentials of a researcher and being a historian and knowing how to access these spaces, and that it closes off, like, so many mm -hmm. records to people, 
um, you know, who have a right to them. Uh, so they do sort of focus on those things um, in their chapters. But I think all of them, you know, the three of them collectively, along with Jessica Cowling, um, like their work is really intriguing in terms of, of thinking about indigeneity and archives and, and just how that sort of plays out. So that's a great question, awesome. though, and I'll have to, you know. Thank you so much. I'm excited yeah. to see the volume. Yeah. Hi, Jen. It's so good to see you. Yeah. Um, what an interesting talk. I'm so excited for the collection also. Um, I know it's been uh, years now in the making, mm -hmm. so, but uh, welcome to Providence also. Um, I'm really intrigued, you know, as a person who's also interested in these histories, I think it's really um, eye-opening, but also altogether not that surprising that both you and Stephanie are trained as scholars of the enslaved and specifically studying the lives of enslaved people with disabilities. So the archival silences and challenges that that presents. Um, I'm really, really excited about this volume, specifically for one of the last sections, I think you said it was called Accessing, mm -hmm. which is about the methodological constraints, but also possibilities of studying these histories. And I was hoping that you could talk a bit more about the, I think it was the first, um, it was the first chapter that you began speaking about. I didn't recall the name of, I can't recall the name of the author, but about the effective experiences of archival researchers who are researching and encountering people with disabilities in the archive. That's such a powerful thing. I mean, in past conversations you and I have had about getting to archives, you know, uh, dealing and navigating with archives given the different, you know, kind of physical challenges that we may face. I'm so intrigued by this because I think we have, you know, we have the tombs by Kim Nielsen that tell us the overviews of uh, just, you know, a disability history of America. But we often have to look at disparate sources from various fields mm -hmm. to inform the methodology of this. Mm -hmm. Often, most of this is emanating from the historiography of slavery studies. And so I'm just so excited to hear more about that and to think about some of the insights that these authors are providing for those of us who are studying these histories. Yeah, I mean, that's you bring up so many great points um, in your comments. And that last section, you know, the section that deals with sort of accessing um, archives and creating archives and thinking about the communities to whom you're accountable for, like, I, it's such a powerful section, which is why we wanted to sort of end there, right? Because it gives a nod to, like, how do we how do we deal with some of these things? How do we respond to them? What do we do? Um, and Grace and Bromeyer's work is brilliant. Um, they are really deeply engaged with critical um, archival studies. And that particular chapter, you know, it's very striking because of the interviews that they um, conduct with folks who had done research, you know, as disabled researchers going into the archives and sort of confronting these sources, um, these historical sources that frame disabled people in these just horrific ways, right? Like either as medical specimens or as like, you know, objects of, of sort of spectacle um, or, you know, folks who overcame their disabilities, right? Like all of these narratives, these repetitive narratives about these ableist narratives about people with disabilities, like whenever you are forced to kind of confront them, um, you know, so immediately in, in your own work, like, you know, these, these folks really like convey, um, you know, the title of that chapter is It Felt Like Everything, mm -hmm. uh, Disability, Affect, and the Creation of Archival Interdependence, right? But it's about like, how does it feel as a disabled researcher to go like to actually confront these sorts of issues in the sources that you're working on? And I think that's a really good example of how <laughs> there's this synergy because I think scholars of slavery have also talked about these kinds of, right? Like just the weight, I think, of doing research on slavery, especially for, for scholars of color, right, mm -hmm. to have to sort of navigate <laughs> the affective, uh, you know, kind of responses um, to doing research. So Grayson Bromeyer's work is really um, compelling in that sense, and it, it sort of draws that parallel, right? Um, but the other folks who contributed to that section, I mean, just in terms of thinking about, like, how do we navigate some of this? And, uh, you know, I think some of their, you know, the work that they're doing is just so brilliant, thinking about creating community-centered archives, living archives, right, where people are contributing and, um, you know, and it's much more dynamic and happening, usually in sort of online spaces that are more accessible for folks. Um, so, you know, I think that, that part of the collection is just really powerful. Uh, there's another chapter in that, that piece that I didn't talk about, 
um, by Shuko Tameo um, and Aaron Rubenstein, who are at UMass Amherst, um, and they, you know, their their contribution talks about sort of making collections there accessible and like how to do that and how sort of taking that principle of nothing about us without us, you know, and applying it to the archives. Like if you center on that, what happens then to the kinds of archives and archival spaces that you create um, whenever you are truly thinking about being accountable to people with disabilities? So there's so much powerful work there. Um, I appreciate your, your thoughts and bring attention to that. Hi, I am Pedro, um, but there is a question here um, from Anna Marti on the Zoom. Uh, it says, thank you so much for your talk. I'm very excited for this anthology. You talked about how archives privilege written English, which excludes many deaf folks without access to this kind of education, and how oral histories are similarly alienating. Mm. I'm wondering if there are current efforts to create an archive based in sign language. Mm. Yeah, um, you know, Gallaudet uh, is, you know, an amazing resource for those kinds of things. I don't know all of their programs and all of their, you know, but I know they have the Shookman uh, Center for docu like Documentary History or, right, like, so they have, like, different institutions and different, like, folks who are um, kind of working on things in that regard um, in that space. Um, I, you know, I think there are, there are definitely kind of community-centered efforts at this. Uh, their, their chapter talks a lot about these things in ways that are far more knowledgeable than I could ever convey. Um, so I'm sorry to be like, you have to wait for the volume to come out, but you have to wait for the volume to come out. Um, it's a, you know, that is an outstanding chapter, um, the chapter that was contributed by the folks at Gallaudet, because it just speaks so, uh, you know, um, compellingly about all of these different layers, right, of sort of thinking about what deaf archives look like and how, you know, again, how they're being created in different spaces. Um, but they also talk, too, about, you know, some of the challenges of that, um, particularly things like the reticence, I think, of deaf folks to kind of give up their mm -hmm. documents and records to institutions, right? Like there's institutional distrust for <laughs> many rightful reasons, right? Like this historical legacy of, you know, sort of dealing with, with autism and ableism in these kinds of spaces. So a lot of times folks personally hold on to documents and, you know, have them stored in their own homes. And there is a chapter in the collection, which I didn't mention um, in my sort of comments about it, but one of them speaks precisely um, to that <laughs> Uh, sort of issue. Um, there's a group of scholars um, who are from the same family, the Holcombs, um, and they talk about like their own family archives as deaf folks, right, and the, the resources that they've maintained and their own kind of internal, <laughs> and it's it's really interesting, right, because they have all of these layers of different sort of generations of their families and different documents and all of these materials that they themselves, including video and, right, um, that are part of this really sort of complex and multifaceted family archive that they keep within their own possession. Um, so it sort of shows us, you know, uh, the, the kind of private, I think, nature too sometimes of deaf archives, uh, which raises a lot of important questions again about power and who controls these sources and, you know, what their interests are in them. So thank you for that. It was a really great question. Um, thank you so much. This is fabulous. Um, I had a question about, well, I was really compelled by your discussion of the, the finding aid, actually, and yeah. the difficulty of, um, you know, posed by these sort of systems of classification that were often developed before certain categories even existed. So mm -hmm. I guess related to that, my question is, like, if you think that there's a sort of larger historical arc that is either traced in the collection or, or generally in, in disability history about like the consolidation of the category of disability over time, you know, parallel to perhaps the consolidation of archives, like, you know, and because it, it, of course, you know, it's only now that retrospectively we sort of apply the category of disability to extremely divergent, you know, forms of difference, right? So yeah. thinking about blindness and deafness and lame, you know, all these sort yeah. of categories, right, that existed in um, previous, moments were not necessarily thought of as related to each other um, and it's only sort of retroactively that that we have imp imposed that yeah. um, on them so I'm curious like if there's a, a, a larger historical trajectory that you see emerging e either through the work in the collection um, I mean it seems like maybe like the moment of the 
early 20th century is an important time, right? Through like mm -hmm. the kind of consolidation of that category um, around like labor stuff. Um, but yeah, just curious about that. I mean, that's a really complicated <laughs> question to answer though, right? Because I mean, I think historically, like, you know, the idea of disability itself, right, sort of changed so much over time. And, you know, like you mentioned, like there are these moments of consolidation, I think, you know, certainly by the late 19th, early 20th century, like this was a emerging and kind of crystallizing as a more definitive category, but it was also deeply me like medicalized and sort of related to that history of the 19th century um, and that kind of transformation in terms of how people thought about bodies and abnormal bodies and how to classify them and all that stuff, right? But the other component and I think to this question is sort of thinking cross-culturally mm -hmm. um, because this is, you know, language is so interesting. You know, I, I, it's not part of the collection, but an article that I wrote several years ago is kind of like a think piece um, about uh, disability in kind of pre-colonial West African societies. And like one thing that I discovered was that, you know, I was reading other people's research, usually in more contemporary times, right? They weren't thinking historically, but they were interested in disability, right? And one thing that they, they said over and over was that like in many West West African languages, there was no word for disability, right? Like, so how do you, like, that it's like a more recent, like, you know, this is something Heather Vrana also talks about in her chapter when she's looking at, like, Central American archives, you know, she's like, when she went to archives and was asking for materials related to disability, like, I, I don't speak Spanish, so I don't know what the actual term for disability is, but she talks about this, and she says, some of the archivists were like, yeah, don't say that, say public health, say this, and say that, because the term itself wasn't sort of introduced into society until, like, the 1990s. That's when it became more widespread spread, right? So even like when different societies begin to use this label of disability sort of varies over time, which then of course impacts like how, how we access archives, how we know what to ask for, what to look for, where it's categorized. So I think there's a lot of layers to it, you know, and another, um, sort of interesting thing to sort of think about there as well, too, is like how, you know, sometimes people internalize ableism, too, right, and don't want to think of themselves as disabled or, you know, like there's a discussion about like deaf and disabled people, right, like so there's a distinction, right, like some folks really make that distinction, like deafness is not, di you know, disability, it's not, right, and so I think that those kinds of things can even complicate like how we think of this category of disability and then how do we kind of apply that, right, to archival materials and use it as a, as a schema to kind of categorize things and orga organize them. So it's a great question. I wish I had the answers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it was amazing to get to hear your talk. Um, so I have a question about, do you know the documentary Titicket Follies? I'm sorry, which? Titicket Follies? Mm -mm. No? No. Um, okay, it's this um, documentary. I forget who it was made by. Do you remember? That's the Wiseman documentary. Yes, the Wiseman, um, the Wiseman documentary about a um, like a um, like not like a mental hospital. That's not the right word in Massachusetts. And basically, it, the the state of Massachusetts banned the documentary even though there was consent given by like the patients and their families and how is the issues of um, governmental involvement and also consent come up in your archives mm -hmm. and then so that's part one of the question and then second is we read some of um, Bruno, Bruno Bettelheim's um, mm -hmm. work and I noticed in the work it was a lot of like opinion and not like it was less empirical like test based and it was like oh this kid is this disability because like but it was no there was no because and how does that come into difficulties in your looking at the archives yeah those are both really really great questions and I think you know that question of consent like that is incredibly important you know and I feel like that's something I saw um, you know Sarah Hanley Cousins really grapple with in her chapter I mean she's looking at the experiences of Civil War veterans right like so uh, you know but yet you know she's trying to get at their lives um, and there are all these sort of, you know, blocks in the way, like sort of blocking her from being able to do so, yet she's trying to kind of <laughs> engage this in a really careful, intentional, deliberate way. Um, and, and yet, you know, this issue of consent, like as historians, like we don't, right, like when we're writing about folks who are 100, 200, 300 years removed, right, like how do we, <laughs> how do you navigate, I guess, those sorts of questions historically is something that we always have to be mindful of. And I think, you know, um, I mentioned even in the talk, right, like that how we represent people and the kinds of 
questions we ask and the thing, you know, like there's an ethical component to that too um, that I think all disability historians and scholars need to be mindful of even when they're working, you know, um, on the lives of people who lived, you know, centuries ago even. Um, but I think those are really valid questions and they're really important questions that, you know, we need to think about. Um, and then the second question about like sort of opinion, you know, I think that also, again, to kind of go back to that last section of the collection when I was talking about Grace and Bromeyer and like the sort of affect, of, like, I think that's part of what they were getting at in their sort of interviews with people too, because there are these, you know, documents that, that frame people with disabilities in really particular ways <laughs> that's very much shaped, right, by the folks who are producing those documents at the time and the opinions that they had. And they were so steeped, right, in different historical moments, sometimes, you know, using that kind of clinical gaze to, to sort of pathologize and medicalize people with disabilities and not really thinking about their everyday lives and lived experiences. Um, or, you know, just, you know, folks who weren't in the medical profession who had, you know, sort of absorbed widespread ideas about particular disabilities, right? Like might kind of regurgitate <laughs> information that's not even accurate, right? Like, but it sort of shapes the way that they, and sometimes what you see is historians kind of reproducing that themselves without thinking critically about it, which is incredibly problematic, right? Because then you have representations of people with disabilities that are distorted in the historical record, and then they're sort of given <laughs> voice again by being kind of unproblematically incorporated into, you know, historical research. That that was something that I sort of came across over and over in my own research for my first book. Um, you know, I was sort of surprised. And some of the scholarship that I was looking at was from the 1960s or 1970s or 1980s, but still, right, like, to just unproblematically, um, you know, reproduce entire passages about people with disabilities that were completely distorted, like, it gives it a certain kind of weight and validity whenever historians are doing that or when scholars are doing that. Um, so that is also an outstanding question. It's something that certainly needs to be addressed, I think, on multiple levels, including by scholars, right? We now have another couple of questions from our remote participants from Gemma Angel. Um, thank you for a fantastic presentation of what promises to be a really important book. I was wondering to what extent the volume deals with European archives or if the primary focus is North America? And then another question. Uh, I was wondering if the volume deals with material archives beyond documents mm -hmm. and or community produced archives, for example, online. Yes, <laughs> yes to all of that. Um, you know, those are really, really great questions and folks are absolutely definitely looking at European archives. Um, you know, there are several scholars who, who sort of think about, you know, disability in European archives in several different ways. Um, I, you know, I mentioned uh, Maria Gallerini, so, you know, she looks at sort of Eastern and Western archives that are sort of divided by, you know, Cold War politics and, and kind of thinking about the ways that, um, you know, disability and, and representations of disability and sources pertaining to disability, like we're sort of cataloged or not or not um, in these different archives for different reasons, right? Um, so her perspective on that, particularly with regards to like Eastern European archives is super interesting, uh, as well as Radu um, Danu, who I don't talk about. Um, I mentioned that, you know, one of the chapters deals with um, disability in Romanian history and its absence, right? And he sort of looks at archives in Romania to kind of talk about like why that absence is so persistent and you know like why disability has been so forgotten um, in these particular archives. He links that to sort of national history and you know um, like Gallerini does as well and he also looks at you know a museum for the blind um, so he you know also is bringing in sort of aspects of material culture which pertains to your next question about that. Um, so there are definitely folks who are looking at kind of the material record. Um, we have a contributor who um, Isabel Lawrence uh, she sort of her chapter is called brain of a woman at 30 half an idiot quote uh, it's a tag that's attached to an image right of a, of a woman's brain um, and she she really focuses on that photograph and that right to kind of unpack um, you know these really problematic aspects of using these deeply ableist and sort of violent sources 
to talk about hidden histories, right? And she's doing this in the context of the British Museum, um, where she ran several kind of workshops, talking with folks, like, you know, kind of analyzing this practice and trying to, you know, even community members, like, to kind of, you know, engage them um, about this issue and about how problematic it is. So I, I feel like this volume, there's there's a little bit probably for everyone in it because the, the contributors are so varied, which, again, was so exciting for us. Um, you know, when Stephanie and I originally put out the call for this, like, we put out a call for papers and we were just like bowled over by how many people from around the world, right? Like we're reaching out and like really excited. And once we had, you know, folks had submitted abstracts and, you know, we're kind of working on their stuff, we organized a meet and greet so that we could talk to people. And there was just so much excitement, right? Like we're, we're in this like virtual space, you know, it was kind of like in the wake of COVID. And I think we, we were all sort of still in that moment of being used to being online together. And there was so much excitement and people making connections who were working in different parts of the globe with different kinds of documents and but still seeing parallels right and finding all of this synergy between their work so I really appreciate all of those you know sort of layered questions about you know the collection and I really think that you know when it comes out folks are going to be really excited about that just as we were um, as we were sort of putting it together thank you more questions Yeah, I have one question, actually. <laughs> um, one of the examples that you mentioned are the ex votos houses in, uh, in which uh, objects in the format of limbs and, and uh, heads, etc., were used in Latin America, and, uh, and they are actually still used, I remember going to such a place as next to churches yeah. and they speak to the miracles that people had yeah. and that uh, how uh, I wonder uh, from that upcoming contribution if there is any um, attempt to systematically uh, let's say map these places and uh, attempt to transform these places into kind of an archive I don't know the answer to that question. I think that is a, an amazing question, though. That's probably something that Dr. Rana would have a better handle on than I would, because I know that she is thinking, you know, in this context, she was speaking, you know, very specifically about Antigua, but I know she's sort of looking at this kind of regionally as well. So I'm guessing that she's probably done some of that work and or that they've done some of that work. Um, but that's probably a question that they would have a better grasp on than I do. But, I mean, it, it, it is an important question. It's important for us to think about, like, what happens to these these things, these objects, right? <laughs> um, like, you know, someone is sort of clearing them out and moving them, right, because folks are sort of making these pilgrimage and kind of coming back over and over and leaving new things. So what's happening to them? Where are they going? Are they just being discarded? Um, are they being housed somewhere, kept somewhere? Uh, you know, the, the objects that she talks about in that section of their work is, is just really brilliant. Even, uh, you know, and I'm working off of memory here, but but they talk about, um, you know, folks who are deaf or with hearing loss, sort of taking candles in the shape of ears, right? Like so, to sort of, <laughs> um, so so there's a lot of objects like that. Um, and they're, they're really, um, it, they kind of capture this whole range of different disabilities and conditions and, I think that's a really incredibly um, novel intervention that they're making in that chapter um, by challenging us to think about what constitutes an archive and what, like, what a, you know, another iteration of a community-based archive of disability might look like. But also, you know, I, I also think what's significant about that is just the role of, 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 like, religion in it and Catholicism, right? Because disability studies, disability history, I feel like there's this moment where folks are like, oh, there was the religious model, and then it sort of shifts to the medical model, and then, you know, and it's like, it's like, well, that was then this is you know like we're in this different moment but that really challenges that it shows us how if we adopt a different kind of perspective um, that's sort of more oriented to the global south and people's lived realities there it really challenges those you know I, I said tenets of disability studies and that's what they are they're these really common assumptions that I think are built into disability studies so even the field itself deserves to be like you know shaken up a little bit um, by these kinds of questions and I you know scholars like Sean Gretsch and Helen Miko and other folks are doing really, really wonderful work in that direction too. So they're a big, they're a part of this conversation as well, even if they're not, you know, contributors to the collection per se. Fascinating. More questions. Let's, let's pass that hand by hand. 
Um, thank you for this uh, really fascinating talk. And I'm going to apologize because I've been sitting here trying to formulate the question and it hasn't come yet. So I'm just going to talk yes. myself into something that hopefully you can respond to. Um, and so, and this might actually go a little bit more with uh, the work you've done on your first book as well as the second book you're coming, uh, you're coming with, uh, you're com you're uh, preparing for outside of the volume. Um, but I've also been thinking about the question that you um, that. Uh, I, I believe it was from another scholar that you started with about how ubiquitous disability is in the archive, but how we sometimes mm -hmm. don't, um, but how we, uh, how it's in this uh, paradox where we don't necessarily write about it. Right. And I'm thinking about it um, as a, a scholar of slavery um, in particular because I think about um, the ways in which oftentimes a lot of disabling happen happens during slavery, mm -hmm. and it's meant as um, a control technique to, if you have an enslaved person who runs away quite often, oftentimes the master's uh, uh, um, um, fix to that solution is to, to um, remove limbs or other type, or, or to engage in other violent practices mm -hmm. like that. And so I'm wondering if you could just uh, maybe talk a little bit more about your encounters in the archive um, and think, and and you even talk, uh, mentioned a little bit how um, like one, uh, one discussion that a lot of scholars of slavery, in particular black scholars have when we enter the archive mm -hmm. is just how how do we process and write about and think mm -hmm. about like some of the stuff that was happening with mm -hmm. such like such deep connections uh, to, um, to uh, especially when we're thinking about those peoples. And so I would love to just maybe hear a little bit about um, uh, thinking about like that violence and that terror that's required to kind of control people and, and keep them enslaved and that and how that um, is connected to the disabling that we often see happening yeah. to enslaved people. Yeah, that's such a great question because it, it really is important. And I mean, I know I can speak from my own experience just in the archives and dealing with these kinds of sources. But, you know, to me, it really kind of reflects that intersection, right, of like racial violence and, you know, and, and disability and ableism. But, you know, like those records are brutal. And, you know, when you mentioned people who are repeated runaways, like I wrote about there's a whole sort of chapter of my of my book that kind of deals with like the laws of slavery particularly like the sort of criminal laws and how to punish people and and one of those you know sets of laws that I looked at were laws that looked at runaways and how there were these increasingly disabling punishments that were meted out whenever folks ran away repeatedly you know that ended with um, cutting their Achilles tendon right, to effectively render them unable to run um, so yeah I think that that you're absolutely right that these these you know those aspects um, of slavery and disability are absolutely steeped in violence. Um, but I think that comes through in other ways, at least in Antebellum America, because it was also striking to look at the records and the documents and sources produced by abolitionists, white abolitionists, because they were so intent on, you know, like sort of drawing in, like getting people to kind of come on board with their cause, <laughs> that they would use these images of enslaved people who were disabled as a way to kind of conjure up pity and sympathy and empathy, right? So, so sometimes, like the, their representations of enslaved people with disabilities were incredibly, like, also steeped in that sort of violence. Just this, you know, they were they they emphasized that violence over and over again to kind of get people on board um, with the movement. And you know, there were other ways that they did it too, with like sentimentality and kind of using these images of you know enslaved mothers whose disabled children were torn away from them and you know like how, how could people not be <laughs> moved by that right like not want to get involved so I think there are a lot of ways that that stuff comes through both in people's lived experiences as enslaved people but also sort of representations of them <laughs> that kind of use you know the imagery of disability and the violence of just you know of disabling injuries and punishments um, to do a certain kind of political work I think um, so I hope that that kind of speaks to your question but you know and again it, it also kind of challenges us to think about like how scholars you know who are disabled also would encounter that violent record of slavery right that's it that brings together you know like disability and racial violence so uh, that's a really great question yeah I don't know actually I'm gonna I wanted to go back for a minute someone had asked me about community archives and just in the last minutes I entirely you know it slipped my mind that I wanted to say um, 
I think it was Gemma Angel who had asked about community sort of archives and where they're being created. And I would be absolutely remiss if I didn't talk about folks who are doing work within disability justice. So there are scholars like Sammy Schalk, for instance, who is like really sort of engaging as a scholar with disability, but also like doing tons of community activism and work. And, and there are many other folks like that, you know, folks like Alice Wong um, and her amazing work on disability vis visibility, right? That's like calling on people that she's published and like doing this, you know, like she, she's a national treasure as some folks have described her, right, for doing that kind of work where she's creating these archives, um, you know, of how disability is sort of experienced by people, how they're being represented, how they represent themselves. Um, but, you know, other folks, um, you know, like Leroy Moore, Moore, I'm thinking of in particular as um, Crip Hop Nation, and uh, there are folks um, like uh, Sins Invalid who are, you know, groups of um, artists and performers and, you know, who are sort of working in these really artistic, creative ways, um, you know, to kind of engage representations of disability, um, you know, within the community. So there are definitely folks like that. And that has a really long history, I think, within disability studies. Um, I'm even thinking of Corbett O'Toole, um, um, you know, who has been around for uh, quite some time, uh, who, who her book, Fading Scars, right? Like she's, she's a person, she calls herself like an elder, I guess, of, of disability studies and right, but she, she talks about like her own kind of, you know, sort of memories, I guess, of the movement of, of the sort of disability rights movement. And like she herself is sort of a repository, I think, of a lot of this information and a lot of this knowledge. Um, so, you know, it's this very sort of, you know, lived aspect of thinking about disability and how, you know, how we remember disability and, and who, who does that work, right? Um, so I, I really wanted to make sure that I mentioned folks like that too, because they're often left out of this conversation. And I think people, academics, you know, can too easily and too often sort of appropriate terms like disability justice <laughs> whenever it has a very particular meaning, right? Like it's, it's a very, uh, it's a term that's, that's really responsible to disability in a very intersectional way, in a very activist way, in a, right? Like that's beyond just writing about disability and sort of intellectualizing disability. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that I mentioned I'm here in the space too.